Hey, good evening, church family. We're so glad that you could join us tonight for worship. Um, I just pray for you and your family. We miss you. Uh, if you haven't heard, uh, we are doing a soft open this Sunday. So uh, there won't be any kids or nursery um, or Sunday school, but we do want you to know that you can bring your families. We will, of course, uphold all the guidelines um, uh, from the governor. We will practice social distancing. We have a sanitization station. Hello. Uh, out there for you guys that want to come and bring your families. Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. We cannot wait to see you all again. Let's go ahead and get into worship. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for all our church family and all those in our community. Lord, continue to lift them up, encourage them, give them strength and love in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Oh, I will call upon the Lord, for He alone oh, is strong enough to say, Oh, won't you rise your shackles on no more? For Jesus Christ has broken.
a minute and make that our prayer right where you're at you might be in your living room you might be in your kitchen you might be in your car but right now that is an altar of the Lord so just begin to invite the Holy Spirit into that room begin to invite the Holy Spirit into that car begin to invite him you know I think one of the coolest things that could come out of this time is that we can remember that our homes can be an altar for the Lord and a place where he speaks and where his presence can be felt and he can move. 
So can you just take a minute and out loud say, Holy Spirit, we invite you in this place that you have freedom here, that you come, that you reside here, not that you just visit, but that you live here. And now begin to change and begin to say, Holy Spirit, please come here in my heart. God, you are welcome in my heart. As we transition into this message, you're welcome to search my heart, to know my heart, to speak. We open ourselves to you, Father. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, wherever you're at, amen, amen, amen. Well, hello, church family. It's good to be with you, air quotes. <laughs> um, never preached a video, so this is new and exciting. Um, you know, a lot of times what can be sometimes not so fun can lead to great opportunity and stretching. So I'm thankful to the Lord. Um, last week I was talking with Alec and just kind of sharing with him about what the Lord's been speaking to my heart over these past few months and, and dealing with me. And I said, man, there's going to be a sermon in this, and I know that the Lord's going to use this. And then a little bit later, I got a text message from him that said, how about next week? So <laughs> when God moves, he moves, right? Amen. So what I'm about to share is just something that the Lord's been, been, been dealing with my heart and been speaking to me. And um, so know that you're not alone if you relate to this, because this has been the last two months of my life is digging into this word that the Lord has for us. So it all started a few months ago. Uh, it was a Sunday morning. I was driving to church for worship practice and had my worship music blaring, obviously, getting in the mood, getting my praise on. And I look on the side of the road, and there's this group of vultures. And I thought, hmm, there must be something dead over there. And instantly, the Lord dropped in my spirit, where there are dead things, there will always be vultures. And I knew in that moment that that was going to be a sermon. And I called my mom immediately. I was like, Mom, guess what? The Lord just spoke to me, and I have, I have a sermon title, and I'm so excited, and I can't wait to dig into this. And so, you know, over those next few weeks, I just kind of kept pondering over that and chewing on that and praying on that. And the Lord began to speak. And, you know, I shouldn't be surprised because at this point I should know when the Lord begins to speak, it's not that he just downloads revelation. He works it out through me. And <laughs> it hurts sometimes, but then I'm always like, oh, Lord, this is the sermon. I have to walk through it before you preach it. So the Lord has started to walk through that. But when he spoke to me and said, where there are dead things, there will always be vultures. I mean, think about it. When you see vultures, you don't think oh, there must be a beautiful bed of flowers over there that they're looking at. Or, you know, oh, a little Bambi must have just been born over there. Like, no, you know, it's something dead. It's a vulture. It's dead. Like, that's just the way that it is, right? Like, that's what vultures do. That's what they're drawn to. It alerts us that something is dead there, right? You know, back in the day, that used to actually be helpful at times. Um, you know, with ranchers and stuff, they used to, well, at least I don't know if they really did, but in movies, you would see them go like, let's circle, they'll see the vultures circling, and they'd be like, must be something dead out there. Let's go check the cattle. You know, I used to watch all those like old movies with my dad, and you'd hear that. And so it alerted them like, hey, there is a potential problem. Some of our cattle may be dead. We need to check that out. It was an alert that something is dead there right? So it began to get me thinking, though, what could vultures be warning for me? What could vultures be showing me in my life, like, hey, there's something there, right? Now, the first thing we have to figure out is what is a vulture? Like, what is vultures in our lives? Obviously, I'm not literally talking about live vultures, like, circling overhead. Like, I'm walking down the road one day, and I'm like, oh, there's vultures circling above my head. Something dead must be inside me. Like, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Although, <laughs> although one time, Working at the hospital, we did have a patient whose toe was so dead that we had to close the blinds because the vultures kept trying to bust through the window to get to them. But that's a story for a different day. So back to what I'm talking I'm not talking about real vultures. I'm talking about things in our life that can pinpoint the Lord is trying to say, hey, there's something there I want to take care of. So what can that look like in our lives? And as I prayed about that, basically the Lord was saying to me, it's any reaction that we have that goes against the fruit of the Spirit. Right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if I have a reaction that's opposite to the fruit of the Spirit, that could potentially be a vulture trying to say something to me. So instead of love, joy, peace, patience, I have hatred, depression, worry. You know, I have revenge. I want revenge. I have words of, of anger towards my brother. I'm short-tempered. Things of that that come out of me that say, hey, that might not be a good 
thing. I need to pay attention to this, right? What are some other things that could be vultures? A lot of you aren't going to like this one. Sarcasm, I think, is a vulture that we use, especially my age group uses, all the time. Because really, something I've always said is behind every sarcastic comment is a little bit of truth. But either you feel like you can't say it fully or you're too afraid to say it fully because of the consequences that might come. So you slip it in some sarcasm so I can say, I'm just joking, when really you're not. You want to rib that person, but you want to do it in a way that you can back out so you won't get in trouble for it. So sarcasm, I think, is a vulture that can have, if we find that we are constantly sarcastic towards this one particular person, that could be a sign that there's a vulture there, that something's coming against us, right? What else could we have? Really, any reaction that is way above what the situation warrants. I am notorious for this. I'm a stuffer. So I will take things forever, and then all of a sudden, the littlest thing that should be nothing, I explode like World War III just erupted, and you tried to kill my best friend and my parents all in one fell swoop, when really you didn't do any of that, you know? Like, for example, if you're out with a friend or your parents or significant other, whatever the case may be, you guys are going out to a restaurant, right, and there's always that question of, what do you want to eat, right? And everyone's always like, oh, I don't know, it's fine. But then, you know, when you have that reaction, when they're like, I don't know, you pick. Do I have to make every decision for this family? Oh, my gosh. Like, okay, I just wanted to see if you had an opinion on what you wanted to eat tonight. Like, whoa there, Turbo, that's a little much, right? As Pastor Matt would say, whoa there, Turbo. So something like that. Or if you go to a parent or a boss or someone that's in authority over you and say, hey, I have this idea. Would it be okay if I did this? And they say, I don't know. Let me get back to you. And instantly in your mind you go, they've always had it out for me. They don't like me. They just think I'm better than them and they want to put me down. They don't want to let me shine because then they're afraid. They're just afraid that I'm going to take over. They're self-conscious and, and in, insecure. Like, Okay, maybe they just needed to check the schedule. You know what I mean? Like there are times in our life where our reaction doesn't connect to the situation. And those could potentially be vultures in our life that the Lord is saying, hey, that reaction isn't me. There's something inside you, right? But here's the thing. Instead of maybe ignoring the signs or blaming other people for our vultures, be like, their vulture is in my way and it is driving me nuts. It's blocking my son. No, sweetie, the dead thing's in your yard. Go take care of your yard and go take care of your vulture, right? Like, we need to take responsibility for our own actions sometimes. We need to see that, no, this is me. We need to think, is there something dead in me? But a lot of times we want to deal with the vulture, not the dead thing. How much of a fool would I look like if I constantly went out in my yard and left something dead there and just tried to shoo the vultures? Like, shoo, shoo, but I leave the dead thing in the front yard. They're going to keep coming back. That is going to be a full-time job. At my parents' house, my dad has this battle with our squirrels, right? I don't, it, you probably all do, but he loves the birds. So he puts bird feeders everywhere, bird seed all over the ground. Like, we love the birds there. But we keep putting bird seed down. Of course, the squirrels are still going to come. So then we have to shoo them off. But then we keep putting that stuff down, right? I mean, it works for us because we like the birds. We'll deal with the squirrels. But in that scenario, as long as we keep putting bird seed down, those squirrels are going to keep coming. We're just going to have to keep shooing them away. Unless we take care of the root issue, they're going to keep coming back, right? But a lot of times we don't want to do that. I just, and spiritually, we don't want to do that. We don't want to deal with the root issue, so I'll just shoo my vulture or try to trim back what's going instead of uprooting. But the truth is, in plants and stuff, we trim things that are healthy. We have to uproot things that are dead. We can't trim something that's dead. You can trim something that's dead all day long. It's still going to be dead. It ain't going to grow. It's done. We got to uproot it to get out of our lives, right? Here's something that God kind of showed me through this whole thing. Death and life cannot coexist together. You cannot be dead and alive. And some of you are probably thinking, wow, thank you, Captain Obvious. Like, Julie, if that's what you need God to show you, that you can't be dead and alive at the same time, you've got issues. (laughs) And you would be right. I do have issues. We all do. But the (laughs) problem, let's dig a little deeper in that, right? Death and life can't coexist. But Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. So therefore, if I have sin in my life, I have a piece of me that's dead, right? But John 10.10 tells us that Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So if death and life can't coexist and sin leads to death, what it's saying is, as long as I have sin in my life, 
I will not have the life more abundantly that the Lord promised us. They cannot coexist together. We cannot have that sin and the life that God has for us at the same time. It's not possible. Death and life cannot be in one, right? So you're saying, okay, what do I do? What do I do? How do I get rid of it then? I want that life more abundantly that God has for me. I want that for my life. We all do, right? So what do we do? Well, Mark 10 kind of gives us a real good picture of that when it talks about the rich young ruler, right? He goes up to Jesus. He says, hey, what must I do to be saved or have eternal life, depending on your version? And Jesus says, you need to follow all the commandments, right? You know, honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't have any gods before me, blah, blah, blah. The rich young ruler is like, hey, I've done that. I do all that. I follow all the commandments. And I love what it says in Mark, though, because it's... um, It says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. And then he said, but there's still one thing you haven't done. Go and sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. And the man walked away sad because he had a lot, right? So the key word there is all. Jesus didn't say tithe your possessions or give 10% of your possessions. He didn't say give half of what you own. He said, you have to surrender all. You have to give me all, and then you will have the full life that I have for you. It's not pieces. We can't give pieces to God. We have to give all to God. See, there's a reason when the Israelites were taking into the promised land and Joshua was leading them through, and the Lord gave Joshua the command to purge all of the idol worshipers out of the land. I mean, it sounds kind of harsh, like, kill them all, right? But the Lord said, you have to kill all those idol worshipers to get rid of that root, right? And they didn't. And it ended up leading to their demise. I mean, it was decades and decades and generations later, but it led to their demise because those idol worshipers were not all removed from the land. See, it's all or nothing. One thing I've been reading is, like, you can't have faith and reason at the same time. It's all or nothing. Anytime that we put anything above faith, it's an idol, right? Anything, anytime we put anything about faith in Christ and what he can do, it's an idol in our lives. It's all or nothing. We either surrender all or we hold back. And when we hold back, it allows the enemy to have a foothold. And that's what we don't want. Some of you may be possibly wondering what this string is that's been floating around my wrist this whole time. Basically, this represents dead things in our lives, right? Now, this illustration would be a ton better without social distancing, and I could actually have someone that I could have tied up. But, however, you <laughs> use your imagination. I'm going to try to walk through it for myself, okay? So, this string represents dead things in our lives. Remember when I said a lot of times we want to trim things, not cut things out, right? We don't want to uproot, we just want to trim. So, when I have this dead thing in my life, this is the enemy's foothold in my fist, right? Now, right now, the enemy's not, right? I still have some freedom, like, I can still move, I can still scratch over here, right? I can still reach my hand. I can still reach my hair. I still have some movement, right? But then it starts to restrict me. Like, what if I want to go over here? Like, I can't really, if I have an itch over here, I can't really scratch that, right? So then I think, okay, God, I'm ready to, I'm going to, I'm ready to get rid of this because it's kind of restricting what I want to do. So I'm going to trim it, right? So pretend like the enemy's hand is still holding down. I can't hold and cut at the same time. Obviously, I'm not that good, right? I don't have three hands. So we trim it. There we go. So I trim it, right? And I'm good. But then I still have a foothold. So the enemy comes back, right? And then it's like, okay, this is kind of restricting again. This is, this is impeding what I want to do in Christ. I can tell that this sin is starting to hold me back from the ministry that God has for me. Or I can tell this sin is affecting my family in a way I don't like. Or I can tell this sin is starting to affect my job or affect me. Or I just don't like how I feel. Or I know that there's more. I know that God has called me for more. I know there's freedom in Christ. I don't like this anymore. But I'm going to just trim it again. Because I don't really want to deal with the issue. Right? So I just trim it again. But now look. Still a foothold, right? Enemy comes in. Look, at every time I trim, you notice how much more restriction I have now when the enemy comes back? Now I have no movement at all. I'm completely bound by that thing. And a lot of you are sitting here thinking, Julie, I've tried to get rid of this thing in my life. I know that this thing has control over me, but every time I try to get rid of it, it just comes back and I feel more and more bound every time it comes back. Maybe that's because we're just trimming and not uprooting and fully surrendering over to Christ. See, because when I fully surrender... When I completely cut, when I get rid of that thing, there's no more foothold. 
the enemy can't come. There's nothing to grab. I've, I've released it, and now I'm free. Because, see, here's the thing. There's only one person that can take dead things and give you life. There's no one else that can do that besides Jesus. I mean, what a trade, right? If I took a dead chicken to a chicken farmer and said, here, I want to give you a dead chicken for one of your live chickens, he's going to be like, you are crazy. Like, why would I do that? I'm not going to take something that's dead and give you something alive. No one would make that trade. But Jesus readily makes that trade. He always says, give me your dead things. Give me that. Give me that sin. Give me that burden. Give me that thing that's bound you, and I will give you life in its place. But we're so afraid to give up that thing when God's saying, I have something good to give you in return if you just surrender all, right? So here's the question. How do I do that? Here's the bad news. I don't know. <laughs> no, here's the truth, though. It's different for everybody. There's no special formula. There's nothing I can stand here and say to you, do X, Y, Z. If this is your issue, if this is your sin, you can do X, Y, Z, and you'll be free of it. Like, there's, no, there's no formula. I, can, I don't know. But I can tell you who does know, and that's, that's the Lord. He's the only one that can show us. Because the truth of the matter is, what might be uprooting for one person, the same action may only be trimming for someone else. It's different for everybody. That's another reason, church, we need to be careful to tell people, oh, you just need to do this. Just because it worked for you doesn't mean that that's the process that God has for them. Total side note. But anyway, the point is, I know and I believe and I've seen it in my own life over these past few months that as I was faithful to say, okay, Lord, I see that dead thing in me. I don't want it there anymore. Show me how to uproot it. And little by little, he showed me how to push that shovel down and get down to those roots and then move over a little bit to the other side and push that shovel down and get down under those roots. You know how you dig, you go all the way around? It takes process, right? You got to rip that up. It hurts. It takes work. But God is faithful to show us how to uproot those things in our life that have held, ca held us captive and give it over to him. He is faithful. He who has started a good work will be faithful to complete it if we obey his commands, if we obey what he tells us to do. You know, some of you may be sitting here saying, you know, Julie, I feel like I did uproot some things in my life a while ago. I feel like I uprooted it. I did that. I surrendered it all to the Lord. But everyone, I still have these vultures that come swooping by, and I don't know what to do about it. Well, interesting passage in Genesis 15 um, this is one of those things, I actually read it like 10 years ago reading through the Bible, and I was like, that is the most random sentence I've ever seen, one of the most random sentences I've ever seen in the Bible, but I know that there's something special about it, and I've held on to it for 10 years until this moment in this sermon. You know, sometimes the Lord gives us pieces along the way, and then 10 years later brings it all together. But in Genesis 15, Abram goes and lays his, presents his sacrifice before the Lord. And he says, here, Lord, this is for you. This is my offering. I surrender all, right? And then Genesis 15, 11 says, then the vultures came to snatch the offering and Abram chased them away. Because see, here's the thing. Once you have surrendered that to the Lord, once you've given that, once you've sacrificed all that, once you have completely surrendered it to the Lord, it has been crucified on the cross. It has no control over you. So when those vultures try to come back, you say, uh-uh-uh, ah, ah, ah. that has been crucified with Christ. It has no control over me. You have no place here. I have fully surrendered that and continue to fully surrender that to the Lord. Get away from me. You have no authority here. We need to remind ourselves that those things have been crucified with Christ. We need to physically chase off those things that try to come back and remind us of what God has done, of, remind us of what we did before but God took care of, right? So maybe you're here today and listening uh, through live stream, whatever voc vocation or whatever way you're live streaming or listening, all those fun words that nobody knew before two months ago, right? <laughs> However you're listening today, maybe the Lord's trying to show you some things in your heart that have been there a while and you've just tried to trim. Or maybe you've been trying to trim and you feel so bound that you don't even think there's a way out. Or maybe you've dealt with it and you've had some vultures try to come back lately. Whatever the case may be, I want to pray over you real quick. And I want you to really take this time and, and ask the Lord to search you. Ask the Lord to know your heart, to really see down deep and what things are there 
that we need to surrender to him. So Lord, I just pray. Lord, I pray through this time where the busyness of life has kind of quieted that we would take advantage and give you time to search us to give you time to know our heart, to give you time to search our heart, to see what's really there, so that we can be that pure bride of Christ that you've called us to be. Lord, I pray that you would begin to move in our hearts, even now, in our homes, in our cars, wherever it is. I pray that you would begin to show them the things that have been holding them back from having that abundant life in Christ. That you would begin to speak out different sins, that you would begin to speak out unforgiveness, that you would begin to speak out bitterness that we've held on to and we didn't even know we were holding on to. God, I pray that you would begin to move in our homes in ways that you've never moved before. God, I pray that freedom would begin to arise in our houses, in our homes, in our lives, in our families, in our friends, in our workplace. God, that we would consecrate ourselves to you to search us and know us fully. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness to take those dead things in us and to give us life in return. We don't deserve it, but because of your love, you give it freely. So Lord, we say thank you for that today. And it's all in your name we pray. If you have feel like the Lord has spoken to you or you feel like you need prayer, I want you to know this church is open. This church is here for you. Reach out through social media. Reach out to a friend or a mentor or contact someone. If you have their phone number or Facebook messenger, find a mentor. Find someone that you can share. Hey, this is what God has shown me I need to do, and I need you to help hold me accountable. Ask someone. I, I challenge you to reach out to someone and say, hey, God has spoken to me, and this is what needs to happen. Just because church may look a little different right now doesn't mean that we aren't the body of Christ that can still come together and encourage one another. So know that we love you. We are here for you. We're excited to be back together with you fully someday soon. And I hope that you have a great week, that you are safe, and that you have a blessed week. And take care, church.